Good morning. Uh, welcome to all of you who are here and to those of you who are joining us at home. All are welcome in this place. I'm Bob Jacobs, and I invite you to stand if you're comfortable and to join me. From the very beginning, God calls us. God sets us apart with a meaning and purpose. We come with excuses to avoid our calls for whom we are afraid. But God reassures us in many and various ways through the course of our days. Even as we are brought to the edge of the cliff, God is with us and sustains us. Thank you. 
ourselves. Confessing our sin in prayer, we dare to speak the truth about ourselves to God, who desires to deliver us and to cast out fear. God, God, we are deliberate. We confess that we are too reluctant to speak and to live according to your truth. We grow comfortable with the way things are, passively condoning injustice. We see ourselves as insiders, excluding those we consider outsiders. We find it easier to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and overthrow, than to build and to plant. Forgive us, O God, for being timid disciples. Empty us of fear and shame, and fill us with love that is humble and patient and kind. We pray this in the name of the one who humbled himself, Jesus the Christ. Amen. God has loved us since the beginning, and God's love for us will never end. Do not fear, therefore, but have faith in God's steadfast love, God's healing power, and God's ability to make all things new. Amen. first lesson for the day is taken from the prophecy of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet for the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms pluck up and pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The psalm for today is taken from Psalm 71. Please join me in proclaiming these words of praise for God's actions. In Judah, God is known, his name is great in Israel. His abode has been established in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. Then he broke the flashing arrows, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war. Glorious are you, more majestic than the everlasting mountains. The stout hearted were stripped of their spoil, they sank into sleep. None of the troops was able to lift a hand. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned.
gospel lesson for this morning continues our reading the gospel according to Luke. Um, we're picking up exactly what we ended last week. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow in Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, except Naaman of the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Glory be to God who gives us the word. May God write that word on our hearts, and may God and God alone receive glory, honor, and praise. In a tweet in June of 2018, the late Congressman John Lewis of Atlanta wrote, Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, or a month. For a year, it is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And the phrase is stuck. Good trouble. That's what I think Jesus was up to in the synagogue in Nazareth on that day long ago. Jesus was stirring up some good trouble. Last week we heard the story of Jesus' inaugural sermon in the synagogue in Nazareth. He read from the scroll of Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These words of hope and vindication of the marginalized were well received by the congregation. Luke tells us that all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. So far, so good. Then Luke tells us, they said, is this not Joseph's son? Some commentators see this as a negative, a put down. That would be heard of something like, just who does he think he is? But that does not line up with the gracious words that we are told in all the spoke in the first half of the verse. What if the congregation isn't really riled up? Who started the controversy that nearly led to Jesus being killed? Well, it might have been Jesus who started the ruckus. It might have been Jesus who inaugurated some good trouble. How? Why? Look at what he says. Jesus says, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here in your hometown those things that you started, that we've heard you did in Capernaum. But nowhere in Luke's telling of the story does anyone in Nazareth ask Jesus for anything. No one requested a healing or a display of divine power. Could it be that Jesus was egging on a controversy? Could it be that Jesus is stirring up some good trouble? But what really gets the congregation fired up are these words. But, in, but the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, 
except to a widow in Zarephath in Sidon. In the time of the prophet Elijah, there were also many lepers in Israel, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. What's so bad about that? We don't hear it. Well, Sidon was a Gentile city in northern Israel. Naaman was a Syrian. Is Jesus saying that God was working miracles among the Gentiles, even at the exclusion of the Jews? Would that be enough of a radical idea to this congregation that they might rise up and try to kill the preacher? Would the idea of a radically inclusive God be accepted calmly and quietly, perhaps even decently and in order? What a dramatic reminder that the love of God is broader up than the measure of the mind and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind be enough to start a riot? Jesus is stirring up good trouble. Jesus is telling those who hear him then and now that God does not belong to one people, one group, one person. God is the God of all. God's love and mercy flows to all. God's provision and protection extends to all. And for some people, that is not good news. But it's good trouble. Will Willimon former dean of the chapel at Duke University and United Methodist Bishop, tells of seminarians who were engaged in a discussion of a student's sermon in a preaching class. Pay attention. One of the members of the class had preached last Sunday at his church and had been saddened that a number of his rural parishioners expressed anger because of the sermon. One man had even walked out before the singing of the final hymn. Attempting to be helpful, Members of the class jumped into a discussion of what the preacher had done wrong. Had he overstated his statement in the, his argument in the sermon? Had he spent enough time developing personal relationships with the people? Had he spoken in too strong or too harsh a tone of voice? The crusty old homiletics professor listened to the discussion and then finally said, Did it ever occur to any of you? that perhaps what he did wasn't wrong, it was right. I'm bothered by the assumption that many of you seem to have that there is some way to talk about Jesus without getting hurt for doing so. Let me assure you, none of you are smarter than Jesus. And Jesus got into trouble for his preaching, so will you. This is always the preacher's dilemma. How far do I go? How much do I say? Am I being too this or too that? It's a leadership dilemma as well. Do we continue doing what we've always done or should we try something new? Are we in preservation mode or expansion mode? Are we living up to the promises we made to God or to ourselves and to the church or have we forgotten them conveniently or in and it's a discipleship dilemma, too. How do we speak of our faith without being offensive? How do we live out our faith but not seem pushy? How can we engage with people with whom we strongly disagree without coming off as superior or judgmental? It's not easy. It's never easy. But no one ever promised easy. Sometimes being a follower of Jesus means engaging in good trouble. Being a follower of Jesus means that from time to time we will get hurt. Being a follower of Jesus means that we will routinely risk the danger of losing a friend or a loved one because of what we believe and why, by what we do. Preaching the love of, that Jesus calls us to share will offend some who cannot imagine 
how God could love this person or that person. And there is the dilemma. Do we follow Jesus and do what Jesus calls us to do? Or do we play it safe? Do we speak or do we stay silent? Do we act or do we abstain? Jesus got into trouble for being who he was and doing what he did. Why should we expect to avoid it? Oh, and Jesus' kind of trouble is good trouble. Never avoid good trouble. Not now, and not forevermore. Amen. Pure rocks.
serving God, but it is the same Lord we serve. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. We are called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism, and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common hope to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service, as deacons, as ruling elders, as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church, for the preaching of the word and the celebration of the sacraments. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of First Presbyterian Church in Evansville, Indiana, now ordains Lisa Calvert, Lisa Forster, Abby Greenwell, M.T. Halleck Morris, and Glenn Killian to their ministry as deacons, and Casey Calvert to ministry as a ruling elder. The session also installs to active service those who have been previously ordained, Deacons Dick Bernhardt, Jane Barnhart, Nancy Bazal, and Sam Wolf, and ruling elders Ron DeHurt, Gary Morris, and Michael Thyssen. As many of those people are, who are present this morning here in Fellowship Hall, I invite you to come forward and keep some space between yourselves, if you would please. As God calls some to particular forms of ministry, God calls us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reject our, reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing all that opposes God and God's holy rule, and affirming the faith of the Holy Catholic Church. So I ask you, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? Then I invite all of you to stand, if that is comfortable for you, and let us together affirm our faith. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the rest. Amen. Those of you in the congregation will be seated. Sisters and brothers, in baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, 
clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now you are called by God through the voice of the church for new service and ministry in Jesus' name. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA, show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, acknowledging Lord of all and Head of the Church, and do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the Church Universal and God's Word to you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people, this is my favorite part, with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? For those of you being ordained or installed as deacon, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus? For those of you being ordained and or installed as ruling elders, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Do we, the members of the church, accept Casey Calvert, Rhonda Hurt, Gary Morris, and Michael Thyssen as ruling elders? And Dick Bernhardt, Jane Bernhardt, Nancy Bazal, Lisa Calvert, Lisa Forster, Abby Greenwell, Glenn Killian, M.T. Halleck Morris, and Sam Wolf as deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ, do we? Do we agree to pray for them and encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church, do we? Then I ask those who are ordained elders to come forward for the laying on of hands and run it if you will move and lay hands on the lanterns. Typically, we have a huge group of people come up. That's not possible this year, so we're doing just a few representatives. Let us pray together. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Through the ages in every place you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. For judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace. For prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and of truth. For leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, pour out your Spirit upon your servants, Casey, Lisa, Lisa, Abby, M.T., and Glenn, whom you have called by baptism as your own. Grant them the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Gracious God, we also give you thanks for your servants, Rhonda, Gary, Michael, Dick, Jane, Nancy, and Sam, as they continue in this ministry to which you have called them. Help them to rely on the gifts of your spirit and to follow Christ faithfully in this calling. Give them a spirit of truthfulness that they may show the compassion of Christ in the actions of daily living and rightly governing the people. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. 
sustain your church and ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be effective servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You are now deacons and ruling elders ordained to ministries of service and governance in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. We welcome you to this ministry. Even as we welcome new leaders, we want to recognize those who have served this congregation faithfully and who are now entering a season of rest and renewal. We are grateful to elders Rob Henson and Penelope Pennington, and deacons Suzanne Kohlmeyer, Rich and Kathy Sigurd, Sarah Wolf, Martha Bost, and Aaron Carter. We thank you for your service to God and this congregation and pray that you will enjoy your time off until you may be called on once more. God has called the church to be an agent of change. With prophetic voice and courageous work, we are to influence the world. Such a task requires our best, our continued growth in faith, our commitment to love, our giving of self and substance. The resources we dedicate here are a symbol of our whole life response. Let us pray. With awe and wonder before you, O God, we dare to enlist all our efforts toward the realization of your realm. Where there is injustice, we would champion those oppressed and misunderstood. When some feel rejected, we reach out to accept them in Christ's name. May these offerings preach and teach and heal. Amen. I'm going to offer a prayer of thanksgiving to Bob Jacobs. This is the first time he has led worship as a lay reader. He banged it right out of the park. It's great. Thank you, Bob. We've received these prayer requests already prayers for the people of Afghanistan and refugees and those still in the country. For anyone who is dealing with severe weather, which pretty much includes the entire Northeast Corridor. For all who are trying to stop violence, including violence among nations. Prayers also for all in our congregation and community who have COVID, for Helen, who is receiving treatment for an infection, for Mona, who is at home after hospitalization this past week, but is still very weak, for Gerald and Susie Summers, whose brother-in-law had brain surgery this week following the accident that killed uh, Gerald's sister, uh, his brain bleed went undiagnosed, and they could not figure out why he was behaving so strangely. They discovered the brain bleed, and they did that surgery on Friday. Then, on Saturday, they went to take breakfast to their nephew and discovered that he had died during the night after being in very poor health. So they are going through a very difficult season, and we want to hold them up and support them as they go through these very difficult days. For Leslie and John, who are dealing with health concerns. For Lisa, who has a sinus infection. For all our friends and members who live alone or in residential facilities. For all who are grieving. For healthcare workers and first responders. 
for a teen who is struggling with their mental illness, for gratitude for family harmony in difficult times, for Gail's friend Max who's starting radiation for prostate cancer, for Terry who is in chemo, for Gerald's brother-in-law who had a successful surgery for a brain bleed on Friday and for the whole family because of Gerald's nephew passing away unexpectedly on Friday. And again, for the people of Afghanistan suffering hunger from the collapse of the national economy, 24 million people are newly starving. Are there other prayers of thanksgiving or prayers of concern here in this fellowship hall that you would like to include? Glenn. Family of Michael Dorman? Rourke. Rourke. Rourke, I'm sorry. My ears don't work and I've got this humming machine behind me. Michael Gordon, who died yesterday. Yeah, I have a couple of uh, Hayes brothers and Terry, who after overcoming five weeks of the ICU and critical condition, uh, and then COVID, as he is capable, but he had really struggled to try to live on his own. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then her nephew, Clay, who has been fighting with her for them. Cancer for about six or seven years, many operations. Collapsed yesterday. Uh, the EMTs brought him back. He's now in intensive care. Okay. For, for um, Kay's brother, Terry, who's been in the hospital, then had COVID, has come home, and it's hard for him to live on his own. And for their nephew, Clay, he's had several cancer operations, been struggling with cancer for quite some time. Uh, it collapsed yesterday and the EMTs were able to bring him back and he's now in intensive care. Prayers for Beverly Van Camp, Catherine's grandmother who has stage four breast cancer and is in the hospital. Prayers of thanksgiving for faithful leaders, old and new, in this congregation. That is a great gift, and we appreciate it. Keep all of these prayers in your hearts and on your lips as we move through the days of this week. Let us pray together. God of all goodness, we live in times of stress and controversy, injustice and cruelty. At times we cry to you for rescue, and remember that we have leaned on you since our birth. O God of all creation, be our hope and trust. We pray for leaders and nations around the world that they may seek justice and peace. We pray for your church in all its forms that we may be the love you want us to be. We pray for victims of domestic violence and victims of war. Grant your healing and give your peace. We pray for those trapped by natural disasters Embrace them with your calm and send them relief. We pray for those who are ill or suffering, that they may feel the comfort of your love. We pray for your creation, that the health of the earth may be restored. We pray for those who are born today and those who will die today. May their quality of life be governed by loving choices. We remember those who worship this day in your eternal presence especially Nick Nicholson, Rita Mengen, Margaret Spool. May their witness to your love inspire us, and may their memory continue to bless us. Now, God of love, hear the prayers of our hearts. These and all our prayers we offer in the name of Jesus, who still teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble. Necessary trouble. Probably never expected to hear the preacher say this, but go and get into trouble. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 